Good afternoon. It's Monday, the 24th of November. I'm Aaron Viner, and this is IB News broadcasting from Jerusalem. With the deadline on a nuclear deal with Iran just hours away, it appears that there will be no agreement at this time and that the six world powers negotiating with the Islamic Republic will once again extend the talks, this time into next month. Hi, this is Margot Dukevich spoke with Israel radio correspondent Iran Singer, who is covering the talks in Vienna. Frenzied diplomatic efforts continued in Vienna today with the aim of clinching a deal with Iran over its nuclear program before midnight when the deadline expires. The final round of talks between Iran and the United States, Britain, France, Germany, Russia and China are focusing on curbing Iran's nuclear activities in exchange for lifting sanctions. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry met with Iran's Foreign Minister Javad Zarif, possibly to discuss extending the deadline. The Chinese Foreign Minister told reporters he's optimistic that a deal can be reached. But other officials involved in the talks say they are pessimistic that a deal can be reached by midnight, saying many gaps remain. A lot of uh, meetings taking place. Uh, the last one, a few minutes ago, has just ended. It was between uh, Foreign uh, Minister Zarif and Secretary of State Kerry. Before that, the American, the U.S. Secretary of State was meeting uh, the uh, Foreign Minister of China, Wang. Now we are hearing that all the foreign ministers of the uh, five plus one, which means uh, the Americans, the German, uh, the uh, French, the Russian, uh, the British and uh, the Chinese, they are all going to meet um, in one room and an hour later they will be all meeting the uh, foreign minister of Iran. They are trying to get some kind of a deal today, uh, but it's not the deal that they were looking for. What they are now discussing is to reach some kind of a basic uh, or a principal agreement saying that talks will be extended, extended but uh, the main issues uh, will not be dealt with right now. According to one source, uh, the talks will be resumed um, next month in uh, Oman. Sources told the Al Arabiya network today that delegates from the six world powers are considering a number of scenarios that involve extending the talks. One of the main bones of contention yet to be agreed upon concerns the amount of uranium Iran will be allowed to enrich. It seems that the parties didn't have enough, uh, let's say, uh, they didn't have the right mandate. I'm, I'm talking specifically about the, the Iranians uh, to close the deal right now. And I think that uh, with all their efforts that uh, they have been uh, using so far or they have been doing so far, um, it won't be possible uh, to reach an agreement that will finalize or that will um, uh, bring an end uh, to the sanctions on Iran and that will make the Iranians or they convince the Iranians to to open uh, the uh, nuclear um, facilities for inspection. As the deadline looms closer, it is possible the sides will draw up an agreement stipulating the issues agreed upon and possibly detail those that remain unresolved, such as the number of centrifuges, the time frame for lifting the sanctions and Tehran's enrichment capacity. You said earlier that Iran came to the talks but doesn't really have a mandate to clinch a deal with the West. So why do you think they're still keen on reaching a deal if they don't really have the ability to close it? It's a very interesting question. And one of the answers um, uh, to this question is a phone call that is about to be made today between the president of Russia, Putin, and the president of Iran, Rouhani. Um, according to some sources here, um, the Russians will try to put another pressure from their side on the Iranian um, party, on the Iranian side, in order to reach um, the um, uh, to reach some kind of achievement that the Iranian delegation here in Vienna hasn't reached so far. While Iran continues to insist it has the right to develop nuclear power for peaceful purposes, even if the world powers agree to extend the deadline yet again, there are no guarantees that further talks with Tehran will achieve their goal. Margot Dutkevich, IBA News.
Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is welcoming the likelihood that Iran and the six world powers will fail to meet today's deadline for a nuclear agreement. Netanyahu told BBC that the deal that Iran was pushing for was terrible and that it's for the best that no accord has been reached. No deal is better than a bad deal. The deal that Iran was pushing for was terrible. The deal would have uh, left Iran with the ability to enrich uranium for an atom bomb while removing the sanctions. The right deal that is needed is to dismantle Iran's capacity to make atomic bombs and only then dismantle the sanctions. Uh, since that's not in the offing, this result is better, a lot better. But as long as Iran is talking to those world powers, mm. is it not succeeding in drawing them somewhat onto its territory? Well, I think Iran should not have any capacity to enrich. There's no right to enrich. What do you need to enrich uranium for if you're not developing an atomic bomb? They are. How do we know that? Because they're developing intercontinental ballistic missiles. What do you do with such missiles? The only reason you build ICBMs is to launch a nuclear warhead. So Iran, I think everybody understands, is unabashedly seeking to develop atomic bombs. And I think they shouldn't have the capacity either to enrich uranium or to deliver uh, nuclear warheads. And I think that's the position that the uh, P5 plus 1, the leading powers of the world, should take. What is the justification of not taking this position? They say, well, it offends Iranian pride. So what? I mean, if this position was taken in the 1930s against Germany, it would offended, have offended German pride, but it would have saved millions and millions of lives. You do not want to give this medievalist regime in Iran that throws acid in the faces of women, that uh, uh, oppresses gays that subjugates an entire population that export terrorism far and wide don't give these violent medievalists atomic bombs that's not a good thing for the future of the world and its security if the world isn't being tough enough does that mean that this is an argument that you that israel is losing well i hope i hope that the pressures continue i mean the the fact that there's no deal now gives an opportunity to continue the economic pressures that have proven to be the only thing that brought Iran to the table, to continue them, to toughen them. I think that's the road that has to be taken. Uh, but of course, Israel is watching very carefully what is happening here. And Israel always, always reserves the right to defend itself. Joining me now from our Tel Aviv studio to discuss the nuclear negotiations is Dr. Emily Landau, who is the director of the Arms Control Program at the Institute for Strategic Studies in Tel Aviv. Good evening, Dr. Landau. Hi, good evening. Hi. Now, it appears that deadlines in the Iranian nuclear negotiations are essentially meaningless, and that now the P5 plus one countries and Iran looks like they're going to extend these talks into next month. Does this surprise you? No, it doesn't surprise me. I was actually here two weeks ago, um, and that was my assessment at that time, that most likely there would be an extension, and I also thought that there would be some announcement of a pockets of agreement that they had reached, um, maybe a framework, maybe some principles, maybe a few issues, and it seems, according to these uh, recent reports, that that is exactly what they're working on in these final hours to try to get some, um, you know, common ground that they can announce to the world that they've reached, so that they've made some concrete progress well, in fact, if you and that they need the extension. Outline for us, if you can, what are the main obstacles to reaching an accord and where has the progress been made? Well, that's an interesting question. According to some assessment, there's, you know, 95% of the issues they, they've already come to agreement upon, and there's only that 5% of uh, thorny issues that they still need to resolve. I would say it seems to me that it's more likely the opposite. There might be agreement on 5%, 95%, which are the most important issues, there's no agreement on them. And it's dismantlement of centrifuges, how many centrifuges centrifuges will be dismantled. It's the duration of this deal for how long um, Iran will have to uh, abide by the terms of any comprehensive deal. Um, it's a question of what exactly will happen to the uh, uh, facility at Iraq. Um, and of course, there's the issue of the PMDs, the famous, uh, what, what the IAEA calls the possible military dimension. We can actually call it the weaponization aspects of Iran's nuclear program. Will Iran be confronted with the evidence 
of its uh, wrongdoing, the fact that it's been violating the NPT for years. Iran refuses to discuss this in the context of the talks. It refuses to discuss ballistic missiles. So there are a lot of issues uh, uh, that I think are in dispute. And maybe here and there, there's an issue where they have come to agreement. So do we need to look at applying more pressure? I mean, the economic sanctions on Iran remain in place, but do you think that they should possibly be ratcheted up if there is to be any movement on Tehran's part? Or maybe it's now time to put the military option back on the table. Look, I think a pressure needs to be kept on Iran, and I think it needs to be increased. I think that's pretty obvious. After a year of negotiating, two deadlines that have now come, and it seems that the second line will, the second deadline will also be passed. Now is the time, even according to statements that were made at the beginning of this process. You know, if there's no progress that's made, if it's if we see that we can't reach the deal that we want to reach with Iran, then we will step up the pressure. Kerry said so, Secretary. State Kerry said so. President Obama said so. They said they would work with Congress to get better sanctions in place. I think now is the time to put that pressure in, in, in place. It's pretty clear that if Iran doesn't come to the conclusion that the pressure is such that moving to a deal is better than continuing on the current course, there's no uh, way that they will agree to a deal that comes anywhere near the deal uh, that the international uh, negotiators uh, have put already on the table. It certainly seems so. Well, the next month will be interesting. Dr. Emily Landau of the Institute for Strategic Studies, thanks so much for being our guest this afternoon. You're welcome. Justice Minister Tsipi Livni warned today that the nationality bill approved by the cabinet yesterday will not be passed by the Knesset and trying to force the issue could destroy the coalition. Critics claim that the proposal is redundant at best and anti-democratic and discriminatory at worst. Here with more is IBA's political reporter Ellie Wogelenter. Trying to keep his coalition alive, a beleaguered Prime Minister Netanyahu may postpone bringing the Jewish state law to a Knesset vote on Wednesday after two of his main factions of the coalition, Livni's Hatanua party and finance minister Yair Lapid's Yesha Tid, announced that they will break rank rather than support it. The bill, if passed, would result in a new basic law defining Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. At Netanyahu's insistence, the government decided at yesterday's stormy four-hour cabinet meeting that all coalition MKs, including ministers, will be bound by coalition discipline to vote in favor of it. Justice Minister Tsipi Livni, who has the Hatanoa coalition partnership of six MKs, is adamantly opposed to the bill. And Finance Minister Yair Lapid, head of Yesha Tid, declared last night that his party will also vote against it. Here is Netanyahu explaining why he's pushing so hard for this bill. The two separate issues. One is Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people, just as the, the purported Palestinian state would be the nation state of the Palestinian people. But in our country, in Israel, the only democracy, the only true democracy in the Middle East, the rights of everyone, regardless of race, religious, religion, or sex, guaranteed. Civic equality. Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people that allows and will continue to guarantee civic equality for all its individual citizens. Livni did not rule out that Netanyahu purposely brought the bill to a vote in the government, the payback for her behavior as a coalition partner. I asked some Knesset members this morning whether they also thought this was a tactical move by Netanyahu to reshape his coalition. Yeah, no, at all not. I think, I think that the uh, Bibi Netanyahu strategy is uh, uh, bringing this law to legislation, to real legislation, as a major Israeli move or major Israeli uh, uh, step uh, while he is thinking of the world, not the internal politics. I can't uh, be a spokesman for the Prime Minister or understand uh, or try to explain uh, his maneuvers. Uh, every single day there seem to be new issues that come up that are not truly relevant to the crucial issues uh, of our day. We should be dealing right now with uh, internal security in Israel, dealing with external threats, dealing with a budget, trying to bring down the cost of living. It's a shame that we're caught up in this issue, which could be worked out in five minutes if we simply sit in the room, and that's what I believe ultimately will happen. So you don't think by come Wednesday, even though the, your, the leader of your party said that he will not support this bill, that the government will fall because your party will vote against it? 
I have a hard time believing that any Prime Minister of the State of Israel will uh, enable or maneuver a government to fall over this type of an issue. It seems right now that something that's very, very important to us, they don't agree. It's a really very, very important issue, at least for the, uh, what we call the, all the nationalist uh, parties. Likud, Israel Betenu, Habayta Yudi, it's very, very important to us, especially when you are trying to talk right now about two separate states. In other words, you want to talk about the Palestinian state, about its identity, will be a Palestinian, but for us, it's forbidden to talk about the identity of our state, that it is a Jewish state. Senior Likud officials say they are considering postponing the vote plan for Wednesday until Netanyahu has completed a softer compromise version. If Yeshatid and Hatsunwa quit the government to protest the bills or are fired by the Prime Minister for breaking coalition discipline, then Netanyahu could attempt to reshape his government with new parties to maintain a majority in the Knesset or call early elections. Aaron? Thanks for that report. In other news, the Palestinian Authority today announced that it intends to delay filing its request to the United Nations Security Council to set a timetable for Israel's withdrawal from the West Bank by November 2016. PA Foreign Minister Riyad al-Maliki told the Ma'an News Agency that the Palestinians decided to hold off on their initiative until the conclusion of the Iranian nuclear negotiations out of concern that the five permanent members of the UNSC are too engaged in attempts to reach a long-term accord with the Islamic Republic to devote the necessary time and focus to the Palestinians' request. He also acknowledged that the PA hasn't yet succeeded in securing the nine-vote majority of the 15-member council necessary to override a likely veto of the proposal by the United States. Maliki added that Ramallah is also hoping to capitalize on the momentum created by the increasing number of European nations supporting recognition of a Palestinian state. One of the victims severely wounded in last week's terror attack at the Harnov Synagogue is now able to talk about his horrific experience. While sitting in his wheelchair at the Hadassah Ein Karim Hospital, Rabbi Shmuel Goldstein spoke in graphic detail. Okay, so I, I came to, to pray over there and I was up to the, uh, the last bracha in, uh, in the Shmuel Asri. And um, I got up to the Sim, Sim Shalom bracha and, and all of a sudden I heard, I heard gunshots and it was People started started dropping on the floor. To uh, I guess I didn't I didn't realize exactly, but I, I I saw they were trying to avoid the gunshots and the and we so all, all dropped down to the floor and then they then the gunshot stopped and then there was, uh, the other um, the other terrorist went around to he banged everyone with a meat, a meat cleaver that um, that he and he came over to me and gave me three uh, three big uh, Bash, bashes with it, one on my head, one on my, one on my, my, my ear, one on my back, and and then everyone was lying there silent, silently, and and then I saw the I saw the, the the other terrorist his his gun jammed and he was trying to fix it, so I saw that he was harmless. I saw the other the first terrorist was the the other terrorist was standing there with his back to me. So I I was able to to get over to him and and pull him down, and his 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 pistol f fell out of his, fell out together with the meat cleaver, and and then the other terrorists managed to come over, and and with the, through a tremendous miracle, he didn't he didn't do, try to do anything to me. He just said he just said he just said in, in, in his Arabic accent uh, that I should get out of there as fast as I could, and I, I ran outside, and then there was. Uh, it was a, it was a, 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 a man over there that, that um, there was a man over there that that, uh, that gave me the, the shirt shirt off his back literally, and bandaged bandaged my head and uh, and then they brought me into the ambulance and uh, within seconds later then the, there was a gunfight and they, they killed the terrorists. It will be proven that my client did not fire the live, live bullet that killed 17-year-old Nadim Nuara. That's the message from the attorney representing the border policeman charged with committing manslaughter during Nakba Day protests outside Ofer Prison near Batunia last May. Prosecutors at the Jerusalem District Court argued that the officer intentionally slipped a live bullet into his ammunition clip, which was meant to hold only non-lethal rubber bullets. But defense counsel maintains that the unnamed officer will be exonerated. Uh, it's a quite, quite a, a, a severe indictment, although uh, we can see uh, at this point that uh, the murder offense that was claimed against my uh, client 
um, was actually uh, replaced by uh, a much more lighter uh, offense. Still, we have lots of uh, uh, information and uh, uh, we have lots of uh, facts that deny the, uh, the prosecution uh, theory uh, and we are going to use everything in order to prove that my client not, uh, uh, not only he didn't uh, uh, shoot the bullet, uh, of course he didn't kill anyone. A 22-year-old Israeli Arab has been indicted by the Nazareth District Court for allegedly joining the Islamic State while abroad. Hamsa Magame is being charged with contacting a foreign agent, membership in an illegal organization, and conspiring to commit a crime. According to details of the case released by the Shin Bet last night, the resident of the northern village of Yafia was arrested by security services at Ben Gurion Airport after he came back to the country on October 24th. He reportedly admitted to contacting Islamic State operatives on Facebook before traveling to Turkey with two friends, then crossed into Syria where they reportedly reported to an ISIS military base for training. He claims to have left the camp after just 10 days to return home. Police arrested four people following last night's much-anticipated soccer match between Beitar Jerusalem and Bnei Sakhnin. The game was delayed and nearly canceled out of fear that violent clashes would erupt between fans of the Arab team and those supporting the Jewish nationalistic Beitar team. Sakhnin won the match 1-0 on the strength of a 39th-minute goal by Ismail Ryan. Despite the deployment of 700 police and 250 security guards to maintain order at Doha Stadium, there were several incidents during the game. The arrest came after a small group of Beitar fans smashed cars' windshields in the parking lot outside the stadium. Now taking a look at the local market where both the shekel and share prices on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange today put in mixed performances. Here's a look at the mid-afternoon numbers. Well, keep your umbrellas handy. The IBA weather team says that we can expect rainstorms to drench much of the country tomorrow. And if you're heading up to the Hermon, you might want to take a snow shovel because flurries are expected here and there. It's also going to be unseasonably chilly, accompanied by strong winds. Here's the forecast at home and abroad for the next 24 hours. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Laura Cornfield will be at this desk tomorrow to bring you all the latest breaking news from Israel. I'm Aaron Viner wishing you a good evening and shalom from Jerusalem. <laughs>